start here. Why now? What, like, why did why did you feel like now was the time to write this book? Well, I was at the Spurs for a number of years, and I had left the writing world, and this was a book that was actually in my head for a long time, because I was thinking about the three-point revolution uh, when I was at Grantland, and I wrote about it then. I had an article in 2014 saying, is it time to move the three-point line back? So it was something I've been thinking about for a long time, but while I was at the Spurs, these trends even got more and more extreme and, and, and sped up. Um, and I really just wanted to use the book to start a conversation about how much is too much when it comes to three-point shooting and what are we losing in the process in the game of basketball as we obsess more and more about it. So something that struck me about the book was there was a lot of conversation about aesthetics. I think that's something basketball writers are talking about on Twitter amongst themselves. Kind of like what you said, is this good for the game? We, we saw that taken probably to its most extreme level uh, for a number of reasons in that Rockets Warriors game right. one, right? I, I'm curious from your perspective, do you think aesthetics something that I think you care about, we care about as NBA fans, is it something the league should have an interest in? Should oh, the league care about aesthetics? 100%. I mean, basketball was a social engineering experiment. I mean, we, this was intended to create sort of an aesthetic. Basketball was a non-contact indoor sport that was concocted. It, this is not something that was given to us by the gods, it was invented by by people, and you know it's been tweaked over the years. It's like uh, I would say it's like the, uh, the 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 chapel in Barcelona that they've been building for centuries. It's a masterpiece in progress, right? Um, and we need to look at it like that. And how can we make it better? Uh, and the book proposes a lot of ways. I think we can make the game more diverse because that's the word along with aesthetic that I've sort of honed in on the most. It's like basketball is at its best when people of different shapes and sizes. Different skill sets can all thrive in different ways. Um, and there's sort of an increasing monoculture, at least in terms of shot selection, but in other ways as well, uh, that's threatening the diversity of the league. Definitely. As someone who is like the center on his fifth grade rec team, I, I definitely <laughs> like miss the nuances of post play. But to your point about how the game can get better, how can the game can get more diverse, you have a lot of proposals in this book, right? Moving the three-point line back. Yeah. Letting teams draw their own three-point line. <laughs> I'm curious, you, someone who you know, study geography, was a cartographer. If if I gave you a blank slate and I right. said you, Kirk Goes, or you can you can draw out the dream NBA court. Right. What would your dream NBA court look like? Would you widen it? Uh, where would you put the lines? Tell me what it would look yeah. like for you. Well thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> but as an analyst I'm careful not to project my own views. Okay. But I do think there's a, some analytical options we can we can use. But I'll play along. Um, I want the three-point line to go to 25 feet, which is about a foot and a quarter mm -hmm. further back and get rid of the corner three, and I want to narrow the lane. I'll tell you why. The three-point shot has become too easy for too many players, so that's why we're seeing these five-out offenses because everybody can shoot it. Um, and the post game has been too inefficient. So what we're really seeing is it comes down to the margin. Um, the average three-point shot is so much more efficient than an average two-point jump shot, that why would you ever take an average two-point jump shot? So let's make the average three-point jump shot harder. Um, so to try to breathe some life back into that two-point area. And then narrowing the lane gives the post players a chance to be efficient themselves. Because right now, because of contract uh, contact allowances, um, you can be really physical with post players in ways you cannot be with shooters. And that's really one of the hacks to be, why is this so inefficient? Well, I'm allowed to push you and shove you when you have your back to the basket in the post. But if I lay a finger on you in the perimeter, that's three shots. Um, so I think it's not just the lines on the court. That's a huge part of the geography. But the, the way the rules are designed and legislated and, and, and then in, enforced are, are very important, too. Well, in your book, there's a, a whole chapter about James Harden. <laughs> and you're, you're talking. there was a, a time when Harden's best way to draw fouls, you, you write about it in your book, He's coming over the pick and roll. As soon as he senses contact, he's going into a shooting motion, three shots. The NBA kind of legislated that out, right. right? You know, now those are on the ground. So what was the next evolution for right. him? It was it was the landing foul. Uh, I'm curious, do you do you have, I know that you, again, don't like to impose, uh, you're just kind of <laughs> studying this stuff, but do you have an idea, a sense of what maybe that next evolution would be? Is there another step that he can take beyond this landing foul? Well, I mean, the Rockets deserve massive credit for sort of hacking efficiency in mm -hmm. all sorts of different ways. Many of those ways have been really cool. 
uh, you know, the shot selection and, and the play types and isolation basketball and doing things that other teams hadn't realized was so much smarter. Um, but the, the logical extension of, 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 of chasing that efficiency dragon is been into the realm of officiating. And we've known for a long time that the best place to score on the court is the free throw line. But James Harden lives that more than anybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what we're seeing now is this dude chasing whistles in new ways every year. I think one of the cool ways the league could look at this is how could we disincentivize that behavior? If we really think he's jumping into contact, we'll make that a foul on him. If we really think he's selling calls that aren't legitimate, we'll call a flopping foul. Like in soccer, you can get a, lot, a yellow card if you're called for flopping. Um, we need stuff like that. You know, it's those. There's not enough disincentives to behave like that. Um, and I think if the league looked at it that way, we could see, instead of looking for the next thing, the next thing is him just being a great basketball mm -hmm. player, which, by the way, he is. Yeah. And I don't want to diminish that by any means. But, like, let's just see the dude play basketball and, and cut this kind of stuff out. Chasing the efficiency dragon is an incredible <laughs> phrase, well, one that I would soon adopt into my own writing. Uh, there's a part of your book where you discuss, and I think rather obviously so was, centers being undervalued the way the game was going especially when i think teams were so concerned with how do we build a lineup to counter what golden state is doing you couldn't be taken seriously as a title contender if you didn't have your quote your own quote unquote death lineup right something that's interesting to me this year at least is i wouldn't say you're seeing big ball come back but you're seeing seven footers come back now granted these guys can shoot but you have players right. like mark gasol joel Embiid, nicole Jokic. Guys who I think as recently as two years ago wouldn't have made as much sense on an NBA court. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you think the emergence of players like that could could that help bring the game back towards the inside, or because is it more important that they can shoot than the fact that they're seven footers? Yeah, all those guys shoot a lot of yeah. threes. Um, none of them really. Well, Jokic posts up a little bit. Markle posts up, so I take it back. Those guys post yeah. up a little bit. But 30 years ago, those guys would have posted up a lot, yeah. and that would have been their thing. And I'm not saying we need to go back to that. Uh, but you're right. The center isn't dead uh, at all. Um, he is having a harder time than ever finding minutes. Um, I use examples in the book like Al Jefferson mm -hmm. and Roy Hibbert that I find pretty alarming because they were all-stars or all-NBA players who were out of the league in the middle of their prime because the game moved so fast away from their skill sets. Um, but the guys who have survived, Brooke Lopez, Marcus Gasol, um, Joel Embiid, Jokic, they all shoot threes, which is crazy. I mean, the three-point shooting activity of centers, you're going to think I made this up, is up 500% this decade. Wow. Yeah. Like, that's, that's, that's a pretty wild, crazy yeah. stat. Yeah. So to s why do we still call them centers anymore yeah. if they're standing 25 feet away from the basket? It used to be make sense to call a guy a center because you know where you could find him? In the center In of the, the court. Center, yeah. And now, you know, where he is, yeah. he's out 25 feet uh, like Brooke Lopez waiting for Giannis to kick him, uh, kick him the shot. So you touched on something that, you know, we were talking about, you know, other people read the book we were talking about in the office. A really fun part about your book, you mentioned Al Jefferson. He was born too late. If he'd, mm -hmm. he'd come around 10 years earlier, right. he would have been such a dominant player. I, like one of my all-time favorite players, Zach Randolph. I hate that there's, uh, no, there's no place in the game anymore for Zach Randolph. You also mentioned Troy Murphy on the other end of the spectrum. Right. You know, born 10 years later, he's so valuable, his shooting. If I had to put you on the spot a little bit, can you, do you have like a, a starting five of guys that maybe born too early or born too late? Who are the guys that you wish, you know, you, you could almost see them trade eras because of how their games would have translated both in the past and, and the present? Yeah, born too early. I mean, guys, like I was on uh, the jump for, on ESPN with Byron Scott the other day. And this guy was like a three and D guy before <laughs> that existed, and you know he he I think his his number one year he made like ninety threes or something, and like Harden shot a thousand threes. <laughs> yeah. So Byron was shooting forty percent from three in an era when that was underappreciated. Even like Kerr and Paxson and those guys, like those 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 dead eye shooters from the Bulls championship teams, they'd be making a lot more money and be borderline all stars. Um, and then my good friend Matt Bonner, who would have been like the perfect stretch four or stretch five if he was born five ten years uh later um i can't name a whole team off yeah. the top of my head i do love zebo man mm -hmm. like he's one of the guys in my head he's in the book fouling harden in this <laughs> terrible way but 
He's one of the guys who I think of as like, yeah, I want to see that, dude. The guy has every trick in the book on the on the right block because he's a left-handed mm-hmm. player. Um, but there's just no need for that anymore, and that's too bad. I'd like to find a way to make his exact game not replace Steph or Harden, but still have a place Work, next yes. to those guys. I, and that's not happening right yeah, now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you, you mentioned at the top, you know, you, you used to work for the San Antonio Spurs. You spent some time in that front office. I think from the outside looking in, we've always regarded San Antonio as one of the more forward-thinking front offices. Can you get, give us a little insight? How do, because we also at the same time, you have the San Antonios and the Houstons of the league we hear, and you mentioned in your book, guys who are still really distrusting of it. You hear you know, commentary mm-hmm. during an ESPN national broadcast, guys being like, well, the analytics will tell you, yeah. and just you know, using math completely wrong. How, how does the interchange work within a front office between maybe a more traditional basketball side or the analytics, or is it all kind of under one roof? Now? It all, like the whole Spurs organization, everything is built around like legitimate trust and empathy. You have to care for one another, and if you come in with that, if you can achieve that in your organization, you trust each other to, to give you good information. If a scout really comes in with a, a th- something that disagrees with me, if everything's good natured, we're going to believe in one another that we're going to get to the right answer as an organization. And it was fortunate that I was in the San Antonio organization, which is very functional in that sense. Um, it starts with legitimate, open-minded thinking and no dogma. Whether you're a scout, a sports scientist, or an analyst, you can't come in with this prescribed view of basketball. It has to be sort of the collaborative uh, process. And, you know, the best organizations become greater than the sum of the individual parts because the scout works with the analytics guy and works with the sports scientist, and you find these truths among that coalescence that you wouldn't find otherwise. So it's not about, you know, there's these movies like Trouble with the Curve <laughs> yeah. where it's like it's one or the other, and that's just I reject the premise entirely. So there's no Justin Timberlake in the Spurs front office. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, okay. Uh, there is no Justin Timberlake, and you know there is no grumpy scout that mm-hmm. is just thinking that analytics don't know anything, mm-hmm. uh, and there's no sort of stodgy analytics person that thinks they know everything. I mean, Greg Popovich and R.C. Buford have forgotten more about basketball than I'll ever know. Um, I'm I'm there to help when I can and pick my spots, um, and they can coach me to that too. They they have good ideas and good instincts for what we should be researching and analyzing. So. It takes that kind of trust. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about Pop, and I think to an extent this is probably a function of the roster they have right now, but you 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 make references to the 2013-14 Spurs in your book. I think what a lot of people at the time considered, basketball has never been played more beautifully than this and always been a forward-thinking organization. They attempted the least number of threes, uh, you know, per game by far of any team, you know, this year. They shot them efficiently. Right. They just didn't shoot a lot of threes. And, you know, Pop has said it's frustrating because after a game, you just look at the box score, you see who made more threes, and that's like, that's how you know who won. Do you think he's not taking threes just to prove a point? I know that he's not doing that. <laughs> okay. I mean, the, the, his last championship, they were winning with perimeter shooting. Uh, Danny Green almost won him this, the championship the year before by hitting a ridiculous amount of threes at the time. And in fact, when they won the championship the following year in 2014, that's what triggered my article as a time to move the, <laughs> the line back was their last championship. Uh, their current shot selection strategy is personnel-driven. They have Rudy Gay, they have LaMarcus Aldridge, and uh, DeMar DeRozan. DeMar DeRozan. Yeah, so yeah. why would we not shoot mid-range if you have those guys? So um, Pop has already revealed himself to, to know how to utilize the shot when he has the right personnel out there. Um, you know, looking back at your earlier point, I do think that was the most beautiful version of the game I've ever seen. And that's one of the teams I bring up because a lot of people are like, oh, you want to go back to the 90s Knicks Heat games? And I'm like, no, I don't. (laughs) But whatever we can do with the rules and the playing surface to encourage that kind of ball movement and sharing the ball and diverse sort of scoring, like, yeah, I want that. Uh, I don't want isolation basketball. I don't want hero ball like the three-point version of hero ball. Um, I don't want jumping into other people's feet space as a smart play. Like, I want that. And credit to the Heat, too, who are also terrific to watch, who had a lot of superstars. What's interesting about looking back all the way back to 2014 <laughs> yeah. is the superstars on those two teams, the Heat and the Spurs, didn't shoot threes themselves. Duncan, Parker, um, 
Ginobili and Kawhi kind of dabbled, and then on the other side, Wade, um, LeBron, um, Bosch, Bosch all sort time, of yeah. dabbled at best. The superstars now, and like they say, the uh, Rockets Warriors, all those dudes live behind the arc. I mean, Rockets take over half of their shots from three. Um, Steph takes half of his shots from three. Um, that's fine. I just want to see the, the restoration of diversity in that scoring structure of the NBA. Uh, just a, a couple more quick things here. You mentioned Steph, and it's funny because the, the Warriors and Rockets, I think, are both modern NBA teams, but they still go about things very differently. True. The Warriors, I think, kind of embody that Spurs spirit, whereas the Rockets are, um, it feels like they're trying to game the system right. every night. When you look at someone like Steph, is he more of a cause or effect in terms of the way basketball is, has trended or is trending? He is so Or is he just incredible. such an outlier? He's that such an incredible, well, he is a, like, yeah. the, the, what I always say about Steph is, like, every one of us has tried to shoot a basketball thousands of times. How did this one guy end up so much <laughs> better than the rest of the world at it? It's remarkable. It's like Tiger when he was at his prime in golf. Like, how did this one guy get so much better than everybody else who's tried to do this? Um, he would have thrived in any era. And I look at him, yeah, he is a cause because he showed you five years ago, Barkley was saying that he couldn't win a championship yeah. playing a, with a jump shooting team. Turns out you can. Yeah. Uh, Steph was really, to his credit, the first one to, to do that. Um, and so he's a cause, I think, of a sea change in that kind of thinking that, oh, yeah, you, you can't win from behind the arc. Uh, oh, yeah, you can. Um, and I don't think he's an effect of anything other than the three-point line, inflating the value of jump shooting, and the hand-checking curtailment, allowing slighter playmakers to, to sort of wreak havoc. And, you know, if you could hand-check Steph, it would stifle him quite a bit. Um, but these are th these are the rules that he's, he's you know, playing with, and he's, he's killing it. Um, but he would thrive in any area. Anybody could shoot like that. Pistol Pete, you know, is probably the only other guy people compare him to. Um, so I don't know if he's a cause or effect. I would say he's probably both. <laughs> you spent years now you know studying shot data and kind of uncovering these truths that have made a serious impact on the game you are so uh, you have a curious mind what's what's the next thing you would would like to unearth is maybe too big of a word but what's the next thing that you're you'd like to focus on that you're interested in and in kind of studying next i i'm really interested in how analytics can be leveraged at the league level to optimize the aesthetic of a sport. Now we have an opportunity to do that in a 21st century way with modeling and computation, and I think that that's what I'm gonna tackle next.